ברוך אתה אדוני, אלוהינו מלך העולם, אשר קידשנו במצוותיו וציוונו לקרוא את ההלל. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by thy commandments and has commanded us to read the Hallel. Hi, everybody. This is Eve Harrow, Rejuvenation for the Land of Israel Network. Today is the 28th day of ER, 5778, corresponding to the 13th day of May, 2018. It has been 51 years since a great miracle happened here, and hence we read the Hallel, we read praise, which is Psalms 113 to 118, with a blessing on this day. It's Jerusalem Day. This is the day where 51 years ago, Jerusalem was liberated from Jordanian occupation, as well as Judea and Samaria. The Sinai already had been freed uh, two days before, and the Golan Heights about to be. So we are in the time period. We're winding down through the Omer. Uh, in just a few days, we're going to be celebrating Shavuot, the giving of the Torah at Sinai, the harvest of the land of Israel. It should be a very interesting week here in the land. The American embassy moving tomorrow. Um, our enemies, as usual, planning to disrupt whatever they can. Our joy is usually their grief um, for the decisions that they made were that, that were the wrong decisions. But those of us who feel Hashem's blessings all the time and feel Him with us all the time uh, take a step back and understand the bigger picture. So this is a great day in the land of Israel, and I hope for you as well. Um, uh, last night, the uh, Israelis, the Israel song, Neta Barzilai, uh, won Eurovision for her song, Toy. I have to be perfectly honest and say, it's not my favorite piece of music, but I could not help but be moved to hear her say, next year in Jerusalem, because the winner of Eurovision, that country, hosts the next year's show. So I guess we are part of the world of nations in ways that we didn't necessarily anticipate. Uh, and it's crazy stuff. Um, just, wow, just an amazing time to be alive. So this week's show was actually pre-taped on Friday. Every year there is a run in Gush Etzion in Efrat, like, you know, a half marathon, 10, K, 10 kilometers, five kilometers, two kilometers uh, for the people that live here. And uh, this is, I live here, I've lived here for nearly 30 years in Efrat, in Gush Etzion, in the area between Bethlehem and Hebron, the area in the Judean mountains that has seen so much history of my people. Um, obviously, the tribe of Judah, the kingship of David in Bethlehem, um, the Maccabees fought here. Uh, so much history here. This is where Bar Kokhba, the revolt of, in, against Hadrian in the second century, this is where the last time we had some kind of little state for three and a half years, some kind of little piece of sovereignty. Judea of Bar Kokhba and Rabbi Akiva was more or less Gush Etzion of today. So it's hard to describe, uh, especially in a world where everything is now, 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 and anything that happened two days ago is already old. But living here is really living for the people who came before me, living for the people who will come after me, and living in the past and in the future and the present all together. It's really hard to explain, um, but that's, that's how I feel, and that I'm really just the link in a chain and it's truly the privilege of my life. Anyway, I just wanted to give you a little bit of the voices and of the thoughts that I had on Friday uh, in Gush Etzion during the run, and so um, that is going to be the bulk of today's show, but um, I wanted to be able to share the prayer with you, to share Hallel with you uh, today, and, um, and that is praise, uh, always understanding that um, we do, we do, we do, we have to do, we have to do, we have to act, but uh, ultimately we have to thank our creator for giving us the strength, for giving us the ability, for having faith in us as we have faith in him, and for not making the prophets look bad. We would not want to do that, make the prophets look bad. And it turns out that um, they knew what they were talking about. So happy Jerusalem Day, wherever you are, think thoughts for uh, the holy city and where God's presence once rested in the world. 
Uh, and we still have work to do, but we have come so, so far. And I can't end without thanking all of those who sacrifice made this possible. Uh, even though this is a joyous day, it came at a high price. And uh, my heart and mind and soul goes out to those who paid that price and their families that they left behind in order that um, we can all, everybody from every religion can go to Jerusalem, can go to United Jerusalem and, uh, and pray, except for the Jews praying on the Temple Mount. Okay, got a little work to do there, as I'll talk about later. Um, but uh, that we at least started, at least started and liberated the city and um, made it once again officially the capital of the Jewish people. It always has been in our hearts and in our minds, but there is something to it being official without a doubt. So Chag Sameach to all of you everywhere. And next year, maybe for you guys, next year in Jerusalem. Eve Harrow, Rejuvenation on the Land of Israel Network. Love to hear from you. Eve at thelandofisrael.com. Enjoy the show. Okay, I'm with one of the people who just finished the 10K. Jill, how are you feeling? Okay, okay. <laughs> Exhausted, but it's great. It was hard. A lot of Aliot in Kratzium, the hills and going up and down, but it was great. And I finished. I finished. I feel good. Good, that's amazing. <laughs> Running through the cherry trees, by the cherry trees and the vineyards. And past the, the boys uh, and Darta, the boys' monument for the three boys and Ezra Schwartz. It was very special. Very special. Right. Okay, go get something to drink. Jill Koch, originally from. Sydney, Australia, longtime resident of Gush Etzion. And I don't know if you heard because, as a matter of fact, I'm moving away because of the, um, the announcements that were going on behind. But I'm walking through here. She was talking about how she ran past the cherry trees and the vineyards, that's what I mentioned, of Gush Etzion. And she was also, she said, how they, wa- they ran past the memorials for the three boys who were kidnapped from here in Gush Etzion. Also for Ezra Schwartz from Boston, who was killed here in Gush Etzion, along with one of the teachers from Alon Shvut. And that's the mix here. Um, I decided to... I was debating what to do for Yom Yerushalayim. Yom Yerushalayim, Jerusalem Day. The... The, the holiday, the holiday, Hallel with Abracha, the holiday for the Six-Day War, for the miraculous victory of the Six-Day War that brought us home again after 19 years of being cut off completely from Judea and Samaria, from Yudav Shamron and half of Yerushalayim, the miracle of the Six-Day War that brought us home again. And here where I live in Gush Etzion, it's particularly meaningful for many of us here because Israel's Memorial Day is the day the Gush Etzion fell, that the four kibbutzim here fell in 1948 to the Jordanians and to the Arabs around you who came and slaughtered everybody after they had surrendered. So 19 years later, we come back. And uh, I'm walking around here. I'm here where the race took off, in, uh, where the race started from, in what's called Givat Zuba. It's like the the center of renewed life in Gush Etzion. This is where the school is, the school named Shirat Hanan, the Song of Hanan, Hanan Rav Hanan Porat, Zichorno Tzadik Levracha, one of the people who comes back here after the Six-Day War. Go, they go to Levi Eshkol, Prime Minister at the time. They say, we want to go back. The Arabs don't want it, the Khartoum Conference. They say, no, even though Israel is willing to relinquish land that we conquered in a defensive war, the Arabs say no, no, because as we now understand, uh, it's not about any kind of peace treaty. It's not about any coexistence. And we had just humiliated them in a tremendous war. There's no way that we're get, they're getting it handed back. goes against all logic that most of us listening to this would have. But uh, that's what we have to understand is the thinking here. In any event, Rav Hanan Porat and other people go to Levi Eshkol and say, listen, we want to go home again. Our parents were killed here in 1948. For 19 years, the land has been left destitute, and we want to go home. And he says, go ahead, Kindelach. Like, go ahead, kids. He figures they're not going to last. They'll put up a tent. If you read Yossi Klein Alevi's book, Like Dreamers, where he talks about Rav Hanan, he, he, who had already passed away from a brain tumor a few years ago, and Rav Hanan says that he came out here, and it was totally desolate and been destroyed. 
And he looks, he thinks to himself, one day, one day, there will be little white houses here with pink roofs. And, <laughs> and children playing in the street. So I'm looking now on little houses with pink roofs and children and their parents running races here, going to school here. The school, as I said, Shirat, Shirat Hanan, named after Rav Hanan. A lot of hard work went into this. This was not handed to us. This was total partnership with the creator. But I'm looking at trees that were planted here, at vineyards that were planted here, reminding once again of the blessing of Jacob to his son, Yehuda. Yehuda, who about, there will be some, your teeth, your teeth will be white as milk, your eyes red as wine, be able to wash your clothes in wine. And I'm looking around and seeing the vineyards here and the schools and the houses and the places of Torah learning and the people also exercising and running because you need to have that balance also as Maimonides said, as the Rambam said, if you don't have a healthy body, you won't have the, the body in order to do mitzvot and to do good things and to physically bring God into the world. So you have to do both, nothing obsessively, but you have to have that balance. And here in Gush Etzion, you have people who are doing that and working and, and serving in the army, the army that protects us at all times. As I'm taping this show, we don't know what's going on in the north a couple of days ago, um, Iran, we having stuff opening up there and shooting at the Golan Heights. Just, just last week, I was with a tour group of women that I spoke about in the Golan Heights, and it was just so beautiful, and we had chocolate, and we hiked, and we made pottery, and or watched pottery being made, more correctly. And then a couple days later, do you know whose house we were at and, and all that? They're in bomb shelters, and that's how it goes here in this country, that constant tension between the peaceful life, the quiet life, in which we appreciate so much when we have it because we know that at any point it can be disrupted. But that is our strength and that is what nobody understands about us here, nobody. And if you don't live here, if you don't experience here, you can't really understand that. The constant tension, but the tension not necessarily in a bad way, but that constant knowing that what you have is fragile and therefore you need to appreciate it all the time, the goodness, appreciate the people that keep it quiet for us like that. As I said, our soldiers and the intelligence and the people who are making decisions, may Hashem always give uh, wisdom to our leaders to make the right decisions. But in the meantime, we've got a race and we've got Shabbat coming. And (coughs) I'm taping this on Friday, on Friday, May 11th. And so we have Shabbat coming. And I'm looking around, in addition to what was planted here, as I mentioned before, there's also wild wheat growing. I'm looking at wild wheat fields. And just behind the wild wheat fields, I'm looking at Bethlehem. And just behind Bethlehem, I'm looking at Jerusalem. And read in a week on Shavuot, we're going to be reading the Book of Ruth. The Book of Ruth that takes place right here in the wheat fields outside of Bethlehem, Beit Lechem, the house of bread, the ultimate book of social justice, of caring for the weak, of caring for the widow, for the orphan, for the poor, something that Israel still does, something that defines a society. Nobody has to lecture to us about how to take care of those who can't take care of themselves. And that happens here. And of course, the birth of David, King David, who for so many of us, such an important person in our collective histories who founds the monarchy in Jerusalem. And right here, I'm looking at Gush Etzion. I've got Gush Etzion, I've got Bethlehem, I've got Jerusalem in the background. I'm looking at the Mount of Olives, at the three, the three towers on the Mount of Olives that symbolizes it, the, the church of the, the mosque of the Church of the Ascension, the, the Augusta Victoria Hospital, the modern tower of Hebrew University, uh, also on the ridge, the ridge from which the paratroopers in 1967 came down to the old city, city and liberated the old city, Harabayit Be'adenu, the Temple Mount is in our hands. Need a little work on that particular aspect. Um, we weren't ready. We weren't ready for the victory. So when I was debating what to do for, for a Jerusalem day, um, and I had a lot of different thoughts about who to interview. Um, people who fought in the Six Day War, obviously, was one of them. Um, people who have some memories from 51 years ago. But I decided instead, 
and you can get all of that and you should get all of that and you should really now go and go you got the internet don't just look at pictures of cats today okay go into the internet read about the six day war there's all kinds of i'm sure on youtube and all kinds of places there's different things that you can see and in interviews with people from there and and the film that we have of the battle for the old city but i decided instead of going back to there um to focus on today and focus on the future and that's the children and that's the people living here and all over yudavishamron people Jews have resettled and and that's for some reason the obsession of the world and why why Jews have the right to live in our ancient homeland uh for some reason upsets a lot of people and so much energy is being put to hurt the so-called settlements to hurt Jews that are living out here and why yeah you, you just have to ask yourself i just said a few minutes ago obsessions are never good so why why is everybody so upset and so obsessed with the Jews who came home to live again and there's so much empty land here if this is about coexistence there is room here for everybody i'm looking down at some arab villages also villages that israel did not destroy in 1967 um as opposed to what they did to the Jewish communities that were here in 1948 we did not do that and we could have and they expected it and the famous stories of in Hebron where they actually put out their white flags and they end up they end up surrendering as it turns out to Rabbi Goren Shlomo Goren who's the rabbi of the Israeli army at the time in a crazy turn of events but they expected because people think the way people think so therefore if when they win they slaughter all the people that they conquer and destroy all their homes and it's a zero sum game then the assumption is that we are going to do the same and we don't do the same and we don't do the same and we were hoping for being able to live together and hoping for coexistence and it looks like that has been taken away from us and not because we haven't tried but because this isn't about how we think and that's something that we have to remember in every facet of our lives in any relationship that you have in any part of your life it's not about how you think and how you want it to be there's another side and it has to be about how they think as well and when you can work it out like in a marriage or in a kind of relationship that is absolutely fabulous but we are fighting a religious war we're fighting a war against Judaism against Christianity against anything that isn't a certain brand of Islam and therefore It's just not going to happen, and uh, and even though there are people here, and I know that there are people in the Arab villages that I'm looking at who are so happy that the Israeli Jews are here, so happy because they have decent lives and they have work, they have somebody who actually cares for them, but they can't say so publicly because then their own leadership will have them killed as collaborators, as not as what we would call moderates and people who seek to live together, and that is a tragedy of theirs. Uh, and I can feel for them on an individual level, and I really can, and I can empathize with them and feel for them, and hope that it'll be better. But there is a limit as to what I can do. So I, as a mother, have had what I have had to do in terms of raising my children with the Jewish values that I hold so dear, about peace being so important, and about caring for the other, which is so much in the Book of Ruth, caring for the other. right for the not necessarily your people that's easy okay but especially in those days and the, the put the book of ruth in context it happens during the time of the judges right obviously it happens for the monarchy because only at the very end is david born but it happens and if you compare it as i interviewed yeah el ziegler dr el ziegler a few years ago a couple years ago and her book about ruth came out um why isn't it in the book of judges the book of ruth because it's the counterbalance the book of judges is a slide into internal war between the different tribes and what happens um uh, when we're not together and the book of ruth is the counterbalance to that what happens when we do care about each other when we worry about the other and that's why apparent according to her and it's a great idea it's not in the book of judges but it is in that time period the time period between us coming into the land and conquering not all the land but most of the land with Joshua but before the monarchy and it is a fascinating time period in archaeology that we have here from that period which is called like the early iron age scientifically speaking we find the villages where the houses are all the same size the four room houses very much the same size which shows you some kind of also fairness within the society and you don't have like 
you know, necessarily one person more powerful or richer, which is what you're going to get when you get a king. If you look at the Tanakh in terms of sociology and in terms of how people behave, it's an unbelievable book. And here we put it into a place. We could see the villages and we can look around and understand what they were up against at the time. Also in the hills. Now we're starting. It's been raining a little more than usual in the past couple of weeks. We normally don't get rain after Passover, but we are starting. And today I'm feeling it. It's warm. We are starting our dry season. And so up in the hills here, uh, no rivers. And so they had to dig out cisterns. And we have cisterns dating from that period, cisterns that collected the water during the rainy season and we have springs all over here springs that now our children have fixed up and they go hang out on saturday night with a guitar and go into these natural springs uh, that were dredged out here so long ago and then hashem gave us this kind of land this kind of what we call the limestone where you have a karstic process where you have caves that come out and and water that trickles into the mountain and then comes out in different springs where it runs all year long so the land here was set up for us for set up for that kind of farming we figured out how to do it not down in the fields uh, not down in the in the valleys where you have your fields, but up here on the hills and the hills are terraced and this is where you can also use out the land properly terracing, which you're still doing today. I'm looking at a vineyard here in Gush Etzion that's on the terraced side of the hill and just a little bit to the east of here, the Judean desert, which is where the shepherds go to make sure that they don't, the, their goats, the sheep and the goats don't eat the people food. The double blessing of Judah, right? Your eyes will be red as wine. Your teeth will be white as milk. Okay. You'll be able to be a shepherd and be a farmer. And that's a huge thing in the ancient day, because if you look in the Tanakh, there's always that again, tension and living together and cooperating between those two types of work. So I'm, I'm standing here, I'm walking around. Um, my husband, one of my sons, a few of my grandchildren are, are running the 5k and I'm walking around waiting for them to come back. And just within the vision that I have here, the view that I have here, uh, is everything that I'm just talking to you about. I'm looking at, and now I'm, I'm over on the side of the peak here of the mountains here and looking down and I'm seeing the coast in front of me. I'm seeing all the way from Ashkelon. Okay, Ashkelon, Aza is just to the south of that. Okay, those were two once uh, Plishti cities, right? And they are not anymore. They are not anymore. Well, Gaza, we still have major issues from. You can stand up here actually sometimes, and when Hamas shoots missiles out of Gaza, you can actually see them coming towards the center of Israel. Hopefully that will never happen again. But I'm looking down and, and looking down where I'm about 900 or so meters above sea level, close to a kilometer above sea level, and looking down to the lowlands. And as the country breaks down towards the sea, the mountains break down towards sea level, towards the Mediterranean. So much history just in this view that I have right here. Uh, and I'm seeing Jewish communities, though, Beitar Elite, and Beit Shemesh and Ramat Beit Shemesh and out in the distance, like I said, Ashkelon and Modi'in and the outskirts of Tel Aviv and in what has to be maybe the greatest miracle that humanity has ever seen. The Jewish people have come home, have built a vibrant, secure and incredible society that is giving to the world all the time. And like I said last week, that's all we want. We, we just want to be safe and secure so that we can do for others. And um, I just am overwhelmed by living within that prophecy. And I talk about this all the time because it never gets old. And uh, hear the sounds, the sounds of the present, the sounds of the future. Every time you plant a tree, you're planting it for your children, a fruit tree especially. You're planting it for your, tree, your children and your grandchildren in order to enjoy the fruit as well. And every building that we build and the buildings here all faced with Jerusalem stone um, because we consider ourselves part of greater Jerusalem. So Gush Etzion is back. Um, the you, Jerusalem day is also the day that we celebrate Judea and Samaria being liberated. The first two days of the war, Sinai, I'm giving kind of a broad perspective the first two days of the war sinai second two days of the war judea and samaria and of course jerusalem and the last two days 
the Golan Heights. So it is just uh, no explanation for any of that. We have this week, of course, next week, this week coming up, and who knows what it'll bring. Um, we have the opening of the American Embassy in Jerusalem. And I'm supposed to be on BBC Radio that morning. Uh, I'm sure that it won't be as friendly as it should be. The British, uh, not known for being great, and the BBC especially, for being uh, great backers of the Jewish right to live in Judea and Samaria. Then again, the British have their own things to answer for, for why so many Jews were not let in to British Mandate Palestine during the critical years of 39 to 45 were being slaughtered by the Germans. So uh, I don't have a whole lot of um, sympathy for their point of view. It should be a really interesting interview. We'll see if it happens on BBC Radio. Um, but definitely hope to have a chance to give my point of view. And uh, the embassy opening in Jerusalem, which is huge. It's not that I needed it to open in order to recognize that Jerusalem's my capital. None of the Jewish people do, but symbolism still is incredibly important. Just like we had a state in the making for decades before 1948, um, but until it was recognized by the world, um, we didn't actually have a state. So there's still tremendous importance to not just doing your own thing, but getting um, getting that recognition from the other countries in the world. And, uh, and the fact that the embassy is moving and that the United States, which seems, seems now to have regained its footing as uh, a leader in the world, something that was devastating to us here, uh, and not just us here, I'm sure to many of you listening as well, during the last administration, to uh, put down Teddy Roosevelt's big stick, but to leave chaos behind because where there is no strength and is no power, good power, keeping things in order, uh, the bad guys will come in and have come in, and we are going to be paying a price for that, uh, hopefully not too high of a price. But the fact that the United States is moving its embassy to Jerusalem and fo being followed by some other countries as well, Paraguay and Guatemala and other countries, and hopefully... Uh, there will be an embassy row in Jerusalem, and, and uh, we will also do what's needed to be done uh, as after that, which is uh, putting Israeli sovereignty on Judea and Samaria as well, and that there will be a now an understanding that we're home, and we're not going anywhere ever again. And uh, it is just the, the pride and the glory and the wonder of my life to be able to be a part of this and nothing that I ever take for granted because I had choices along the way also and um, places that I could have stayed and done very well and lived a full Jewish life. But for me, there's absolutely no way to live a full Jewish life unless you're living it in the country, in Eretz Yisrael, um, to be a part of the Am, to be a part of the people, to be living with the Torah, and in our land is a connection that is just, wow. Talk about the Triple Crown. That is the total Triple Crown. So there you go. Some thoughts and some voices uh, during this very, very special time here in the land of Israel. But before I go, uh, probably for two weeks, next Sunday is Shavuot, so if you hear a show that day, it obviously will have been pre-taped, but um, I probably will not be doing a show next week. So I want to thank, as usual, Ben and Tabitha and everybody at the station. But there are also two more thanks that I would like to give. And uh, Hebrew is going to be followed by English. And I'm reading here from the Book of Ruth, Chapter 1. Vatomer Ruth. Al tifki bi la zavech la shuv meacharayich ki el asher telchi elech ובאשר תליני אלין, עמך עמי ואלוקייך אלוקיי, באשר תמות ימות ושם אקבר, כה יעשה השם לי וכה יוסיף, כי המוות יפריד ביני ובינך. This is Ruth saying to Nomi, don't make me go back, don't make me go back to Moab. Um, for wherever you go, do not urge me to leave you, to turn back and not follow you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus and, and more may the Lord do to me if anything but death parts me from you. And that is the from the book of Ruth, 
and that is the Moabite, that is the former enemy who joins the Jewish people, uh, puts her, joins the people, joins our God. And um, we know where the story leads from there. So that is one thank you to Ruth for what she did so long ago. And here now, and again, English will follow Hebrew, reading from Jeremiah 31, Yirmiyahu Lamed Aleph. Ko amar Hashem, kol berama nishma, nihi b'chi tamurim, rechel mevakal baneha, meagal lehinachem al baneha ki eneno. Ko amar Hashem, minayin kolech mi bechi veinayich midimah, ki yesh schar l'kpulatech neum Hashem, v'shavu meeretz oyev, v'yesh tikva l'acharatecha neum Hashem, v'shavu banim l'gvulam. Thus said the Lord, a cry is heard in Ramah, wailing, bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children who are gone. Thus said the Lord, restrain your voice from weeping, your eyes from shedding tears. For there is a reward for your labor, declares the Lord. They shall return from the enemy's land. And there is hope for your future, declares the Lord. Your children shall return to their country. V'shavu banim ligvulam. Your children shall return to their borders. And so we have... So thank you, in addition to everybody else, thank you to Ruth, and thank you to Rachel Imein, to the matriarch Rachel, and to everybody else who have been a part of returning to our country, and we are never leaving again. Yom Rushalayim Sameach, have a wonderful Jerusalem day, Kav Chediyar, this day in Iyar, a special day for the Jewish people, uh, special forces on our side. So pray for good. Pray for health and all the wonderful things. And I will be back. Eve Harrow Rejuvenation on the Land of Israel Network. Goodbye, everybody, for now. In an unprecedented revelation that shocked the world, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu exposed Iran's diabolical plan to build nuclear weapons and ultimately thrust the world into nuclear war. How did Israel successfully penetrate the most protective and secretive bunker in Tehran and extract thousands of files from under the Iranian regime? And the one question nobody seems to be asking is, why does Iran want to destroy Israel in the first place? This week on Israel Inspired. Israel Inspired with Ari Abramowitz and Jeremy Gimpel on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. Sharing the truth.